good afternoon, everybody. It's 5.30, so we're going to get started. Be respectful of your time. I'm Mayor Diane Merlin, and I want to say welcome and thank you for coming to this community meeting. Um, <coughs> as you know, we have been public safety is our top priority, and as a city, we're responsible for ensuring that we respond to people's needs and calls for service and provide fair services that are fair and equitable and effective. And to that end, We've invited Barry Dunn, a national consulting firm, to help us evaluate, take a look at what we're doing here in the city of Urbana as far as our police and fire um, responses. So we're doing a comprehensive community safety review. And I'd like to have Michelle Weinzettel, Weinzettel, my friend is Michelle, Michelle Weinzettel, and James Michael here to facilitate this <coughs> conversation. Um, we've asked Barry Dunn to evaluate the services that are being provided by our police and fire department and um, identify services that may be more appropriate for an alternative response model. And then to look at some of these different response models. This whole process is going to take about 18 months. They've already um, started. They've been collecting a great deal of data and working very closely with our police and fire departments and other departments. And I think we're going to have a very good picture of what we're doing and how we could uh, possibly improve things. So part of the whole process mm -hmm. is involving the community. There's an online, sur um, online questionnaire there now, there will be a survey, and then there will be some meetings um, at like this tonight and perhaps in the future. And then the, the team is in town this week. They'll be talking um, and listening to the members from the CPRB and meeting Tomorrow and on Wednesday. So, so this is part of the process, and again, I want to thank you for being here. And I'm James. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate Thanks. it. Well, good afternoon, good evening, early evening, whatever it might be. Um, I appreciate uh, appreciate everybody being here and taking some time to visit with us. Um, just a couple of things, kind of before we get rolling. Uh, you may or may not notice there's no one here from the police department. That's on purpose. Uh, we specifically, when we do these meetings, ask the police department not to be present, uh, just because we want folks to be able to come in and feel that uh, they can speak their mind and be free with any comments that they might have. Uh, and that's kind of how we're going to do this tonight. We do have a pretty small group, which will make this, uh, it'll be, make it fairly nice, and I think uh, give us a good opportunity to, to visit a little bit. Folks, if you're here for the meeting, if you wouldn't mind coming and sitting down in the front section in the middle, that would be great. Um, so, um, again, uh, I'm with Barry Dunn. My name is Michelle Weinzell. I'm a manager. Barry Dunn is a national consulting firm. We're based out of the other Portland, Portland, Maine. Uh, and uh, we have been, the firm's been in existence for, I think, around 50 years. Uh, we're roughly 900 employees. It's a pretty good size uh, firm. Uh, we do national consulting all across the country. We have offices up and down the East Coast, one in Phoenix, and a, an office that we recently opened in Puerto Rico. So uh, the, the firm does a lot of this work uh, in a whole variety of different categories, uh, technology acquisition, and uh, we also do work, work with cities on auditing and tax and, and those types of things as well. Uh, but the lane that we're in is uh, specifically within our project uh, which is our Justice and Public Safety section. Um, and I lead the public safety practice uh, for Barry Dunn. And so really what we're, as the mayor explained, what we're here to do in Urbana is to look at um, really the, it's a community safety review. And we're looking at not only uh, police and fire service delivery and, and things that, you know, ways that um, those departments might be able to improve services, we're also doing a staffing study to understand what their staffing needs are, uh, and it's a workload-based staffing study. Uh, and we're also going to be uh, looking at, as the mayor kind of alluded to, uh, re-examining the kind of the, the response model, the call and response model. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, my background is 27 years in policing. I was a police chief for 17 years. Uh, when I uh, retired from public uh, service officially, I went and ran a master's public safety leadership program at St. Louis State University. I have a doctorate degree in higher education, uh, as well as a master's and bachelor's in organizational management and communication. 
I'm doing this work full time across the country in all kinds of different venues in large and, sh large and small sizes, about eight years full time. Um, this project is similar to kind of our full operational study, although it's a little bit more targeted. So we're looking at some very specific things here, but also looking at things much more broadly. As the mayor explained, uh, this is about an 18 month process. There's a lot of steps to go through uh, to kind of find our way to the very end to, in order to make recommendations about uh, ultimately uh, what's gonna align best with uh, industry best practices, both for police and fire service delivery, uh, but also uh, in a way that's going to align with uh, community needs and values and is what, in a way that's customized uh, to, to your uh, unique setting here in Urbana. So again, I just want to say thanks very much for everybody that's come and I'm going to let my colleague introduce himself. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening. Uh, my name is James Mickle. Uh, that's Pickle with an M for pronunciation. Uh, and I'm a senior consultant with Barry Dunn. Um, I've worked with the firm for a year and a half. Uh, previous to then, I spent 25 years as a local government um, administrator. Um, ended my career as a Parks and Recreation Director in Virginia, where I reside, uh, close to Virginia Beach in Norfolk, um, with 400,000 households um, in the coastal surrounded by water uh, military town. Um, in that role, I work very closely with the police chief and the police department uh, in some uh, community uh, wellness programs and services, and one which we won a national award uh, for gauging youth between the ages of 13 and 17 uh, during the peak season of summer where uh, there was an uptick in crimes of uh, that age group. Um, I work in the Parks Recreational Libraries practice where I spend the majority of my time creating strategic and master plans for parks and recreation agencies, but I'm excited to work here with Michelle um, as I also lead um, our practice and working on diversity, equity, and inclusion and some things related to change management. Uh, so really um, want to be engaged in this process and ensuring that it's equitable to all aspects of the community, not just demographically in mm -hmm. race, but um, in market segments and different interest groups. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Thanks, James. So what you're going to see is James typing feverishly on the computer. Um, just a couple of things to start out with. Um, you are welcome to share your name if you want. You don't have to. We're, we're not recording this. We don't record people's names. This is really all about just taking feedback from you um, for us to funnel into the larger um, data gathering process that we're going to do. Uh, the mayor alluded to this. If you're not aware, we have set up a specific website for this project using a tool called Social Pinpoint. If you haven't already visited that site, you can find it through the city's website. There's a link there. You'll find information about, about this project. You'll find a, a, a project outline that kind of explains what we're going to do, what the schedule looks like. You'll also find on there opportunities to provide feedback. Uh, in, in addition to meetings that we may post on that site, you'll also find that there is a portal there to enter feedback about police and fire departments. And um, you might want to visit that fairly soon because I think that's going to close I'll go back and check it to see exactly when it's going to close. But the, uh, part of the idea for that is uh, we want to give everybody an opportunity to provide feedback in a forum that's most comfortable for them. So you're welcome to share uh, verbal feedback with us here. But you can also, if it makes you feel better or if it's easier for you, you can also go online and, uh, and provide some feedback there. As the mayor also explained, uh, in the coming months, there will be a uh, community survey that's going to go out that will dig into some of these areas in a little bit more of a structured format, really seeking to look at uh, the public safety aspects of the community and what people's impressions are of public safety within the city. So I uh, encourage you to watch for that. We will uh, be doing whatever we can to make people aware of how they can plug into that, whether it's a written one or an online survey, those kind of things. So uh, again, uh, happy to have everybody here. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about this tonight. Uh, we do this in a rather informal uh, process. <clears throat> um, there really aren't set questions. Uh, so if anybody's kind of got that regimented, I want to follow a outline of questions, you won't find that. Uh, we don't do it that way and it's rather on purpose. Again, it's really intended to be unstructured and to allow the conversation to go where it needs to go. 
few things about how we do this. We're going to ask for some feedback about the police and fire department. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit later toward a little bit later in the meeting about alternative response, and I'll fill you in a little bit more about that if that's not a term that's very familiar to you. Uh, I would ask you to um, certainly share your information and your feelings with us. Uh, how many people in here remember, anybody remember the old magazine, Outdoor Life? Anybody remember that? There's a few of us. <laughs> it's, 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 it's getting to be a smaller number every time I ask that question. <clears throat> there used to be a section in there called This Happened to Me. Anybody remember that? There was a page in there always about some cataclysmic thing that happened to somebody and how they narrowly survived their life. Um, this really isn't about a storytelling tonight. It's really about us understanding what your perspectives are uh, and why. Um, so again, we definitely want to hear from you. We want everyone to feel free to use their voice. A couple things about that. Um, First and foremost, we want this to be a safe space for everyone to share. So please feel free to share. And number two, about that, we would ask you to refrain from sharing about other people sharing or to refrain from commenting about other people sharing. Um, everyone's perspectives are welcome here. Everyone's perspectives are unique to them. And we want to make sure that those can, can come through in the conversation without anyone feeling uh, intimidated uh, by that process. So. Um, before we go any further, I'm just going to hit the pause button for a second and just ask if there's any questions before we kind of start taking more feedback. I don't see any hands. So um, what we're going to do here is I will just, we're just going to kind of get this conversation started. If you want to rate, if you want to speak, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'll acknowledge you and I will use my best professor brain to remember who was next in line and try to circle back to you kind of in that sequence. So. Um, Um, so, um, anyway, the first thing that we're going to do, and this isn't really restricted to either police or fire, uh, but the question is, <clears throat> what are your general impressions of the police and fire departments in terms of their service to the community? What are those things that stand out to you, um, things, that, things that you observe that are positive, or things that you observe that you think um, the departments could do better, or how they could provide service in a better way? So. What I tell people is this is the interactive portion of the evening. So feel free to let me know if you have something you want to contribute. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Sorry, with the fire department, my uh, interaction is totally positive. I mean, we've never had a fire. The firemen used to come around to check our uh, smoke detectors. Smoke. <coughs> that hasn't happened recently on safety. Uh, that was always and then um, I was uh, a public school teacher, so the firemen going to the elementary school and the kids that were introduced was always a super positive thing. You know, every kid knows how to, what is how to get down, stop, drop, and roll, you know, everybody knows that. So um, I just, I don't have any negative feelings, just very positive about what goes on in the town as far as the fire department goes. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Well, 911 worked very well for us. My husband had a heart attack and he was there. And got us to the hospital and everything that we needed. And that was good. Because I sure knew what he did. Share individual responses. So, very intentionally, 
uh, there's not going to be anywhere in the report that says a person said this or a person said that. What we're really looking for in the broader scheme is what are the patterns of things we hear? All of us have had that circumstance, right, where one person has said something and we go, well, is that really representative of everybody or is there something here, right? And once we start to hear those kind of things three, four, five, ten times, we start going, okay, wait a minute, maybe there's something here that we need to think about. Um, even then, <clears throat> our goal is to, is to use a combination of quantitative and qualitative data analysis and triangulate data such that when we, when we come out with statements for, and or recommendations, uh, we want those to be validated uh, by multiple data points, quite frankly. Um, and I'm a big believer that even if somebody brings something up that, that might be an anomaly, uh, it's certainly worth looking at uh, because there might be a reason why someone feels that way, which might be worth um, conveying. However, having said all that, what you will see ultimately within the report is a, um, a theming of the information coming back to the community about impressions people had of police and fire departments, some of the topics that we're going to cover. And that will, that will cover, thanks Mr. Bad Mayor. Thank you. And that will cover uh, not only this meeting, but the online feedback and any other subsequent meetings that we do in this particular uh, meeting or structure. You'll also see, and I talked about the community survey, there will also be another survey, because we all need more surveys, right? <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit more about the alternative call for service model uh, a little bit later, but there will be a specific survey that relates to that that we'll ask people about as well. But the, but the rather long-winded answer to your question is, um, what, what's going to go into the report is a general a compilation of the themes of the topics and information that came out from the various meetings that we have. Okay. okay. So, yeah, I'd like to <coughs> yeah. comment if I could be back on staff. Um, uh, so, uh, I know that 27% of Urbana residents live in poverty, um, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. So that's, um, like the, the poverty threshold for an individual um, is about $14,000 income per year, and most households um, for Urbana have two people in them, and the threshold for that, for the poverty level, is 18000 a year, um, which, I mean, the 27% of Urbana lives below that. Um, the, <laughs> shockingly, the national poverty percentage is 11.6%, right? So 27% of Urbana, um, the According, um, well, basically, uh, poverty um, you know, breeds a lot of just desperation for basic needs, and um, you know, I uh, can't speak from experience, but like, you know, until Urbana, you know, all municipalities, municipalities can make. You know, until we get serious about addressing poverty, which is like the root cause of a lot of, you know, what we call crime, uh, public safety is really not going to be, basically it'll be like a buzzword, because um, we need to get to, you know, the root of like why people are acting the way they're acting, um, both, you know, materially and culturally. Um, I, Another like demand is an over policing of, of black folks in Urbana, which in particular, uh, from 1988 to 2019. Over 40 percent of arrests by Urbana PD um, involve black people. You know, for Urbana, like 17 percent black. Um, I think having alternatives to police, like a few municipalities in the U.S. have. Uh, going to do all right um, is important. Like, let, let, me, let me just hit oh, one for a second. Sure, yeah, yeah, say, I, 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 <clears throat> first thing is that um, I think we can all agree, at least I hope we can all agree, that there's 
like the social issues going on in our country that extend beyond the ability of the police or fire department to fix, right? I mean, there, there are some things that, and we could probably spend several hours having conversations about that and maybe solve them <laughs> if we had enough time. Um, and so what we, from a public safety standpoint, at some point, police and fire departments are, they're saddled with responding to the condition that's present, right? Um, we can certainly look to city or state or federal leaders to make adjustments, and those are those are not those aren't topics or conversations we shouldn't have. But they certainly they kind of they're kind of elevated at a perspective that goes beyond what the police officer or the firefighter or, or a uh, you know a team can can uh, can do. Um, there's one of the things about demographics. Uh, area demographics that is problematic is that um, first and first of all, I haven't looked at your data set, so I. But I will just I'll give you an example. Um, we're doing we just did a project up in Oak Park, um, and we looked at a lot of their demographics. One of the challenges that you see is um, looking at the demographics of people that move through your community, as opposed to what the census says lives there, and. Um, I can tell you that we did we did a deep dive on the demographics with contacts um, that the police department has with people from the region, and we found a significant difference between the stated uh, population demographics and the demographics of that research. So any social scientist will tell you that if you're going to start looking at um, race statistics and and pull those into the conversation. Part of what you need to do is to understand what the actual population is that you're engaging with, and, and really the American Community Survey or even census data doesn't do a terrific job of isolating that whole. Now, it does give us some indication, right? And when those numbers are disparate, it's a good place to start to have some additional conversations. But it's just a, we just have to be careful about drawing conclusions from that stuff unless we have more detailed information about exactly what those demographics are in the world that we're dealing with. So, but good point. Yeah, I'll come back. So let me, one second. Yes, ma'am. Yes? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, I think part of the frustration is is that both the fire and the police are going to be dealing with instances where as a lot of safety is what can I'm not safe today, am I safe tomorrow as it's been safe here. And um, it's almost like you're dealing with the frosting when the cake, there's a problem. One of the things since I try to pay attention to Urbana City Council meetings is how often people come up talking about it's hard to get um, Rent. It, 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 it's hard to get housing. There's this great need when the um, wait list opens up 10 times, more than 10 times the number of people that could possibly get a voucher actually are able to, and they have to wait three years to get back. Um, if you want to know safety, this is something that I've also heard disabled people talk about, is that when you're trying to deal with um, whether or not I'm safe, they're not going to be talking about instances. They got to have a safe environment because if it's in an instance, they're not. Well, if I only start thinking about it now, that's not going to help. I'm just going to nobody will help me. I'm going to die. So, um, yeah, I mean, if was, you're, you 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 label this as public safety and then cut it down by saying fire the police, and I think that it's a reasonable response for people who want to be safe all the time, all the ways, to say we want to talk about everything. Because it's holistic, and it's not just individuals, it's communities. Certainly, and, and, and to that point, a couple of things. A person's sense of, of safety within their community is different from how many incidents the police respond to or the fire responds to, right? I mean, 
your sense of public, your sense of safety within your community is, is comprised of many, many factors. It might have to do with what your housing circumstance is. It might have to do with the level of crime in your area. It might have to do with whether you're, whether you're free to move about or you're ambulatory or you have other um, you know, disabilities or other things. So there are many things that comprise the, the, the spectrum of public safety. And we will explore a lot of those within the community safety survey that will come out, um, really within the context of the, the deeper work that we're doing here. We're really focused on the contributions of the police department and the fire department as it relates to the work they do relative to public safety, which is, to your point, not to discount that there aren't other elements that factor into public safety, but those are those are really within the scope of the project of work that we're doing. So, and so I need to Yeah, two things. Um, I I really have a problem with trying to talk about police and fire and not talking about the context in which they operate. And I think I think we're being kind of channeled into this narrow funnel where we look at police and we look at fire and we try to connect what public safety issues, poverty, to other kinds of things. Somehow we are breaking the rules of the research project, and therefore we, you know, we're, we're, we're really kind of fabricating things or we're off topic and we should come back on Thursday for another, for another session. So I, I find that paradigm pretty problematic. Secondly, it also seems to me that to, to, to say that um, a census presents us with static data and therefore we have to look at other data, blah, 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 which, is, which I totally agree with. But we can also just discredit that data completely by saying, oh, well, until we gather more data, we can't make a statement about racial discrimination, about structural inequality, et cetera, et cetera, in the city of Urbana, which is obviously a huge problem. And so, and, and the police cannot be looked at separate from that. So I'm just, I, I mean, the paradigm that's, that seems to be dominating here for me is very disturbing. It's, it's just, we have to look at police, we have to look at fire, and if we try to broaden the analysis or connect that to other things, it's somehow um, problem, problematic methodology. Well, let me just say, I, did, I, I hope I didn't say or give the impression that looking at those demographic, demographic numbers in the context of the work they're, that they're doing, that we shouldn't do that. I, I, I didn't mean to say that, if that's what you heard. Uh, it is relevant. What I, what I said, what I think I said, and what I meant to say is that we have to be careful about uh, providing causal relationships based on data which we don't really know is accurate. And, and again, I can tell you from other projects that we've done that um, community demographics based on, again, ACS or, or census survey don't necessarily represent uh, the the interactive population that the police department is working with. But again, that doesn't discount their value in the broader sense of it. Also, I guess my other question to you would be, uh, help, help us understand the broader uh, public safety aspects that you're talking about that, um, that exceed beyond the boundaries of police and fire. Well, I think the previous speaker laid out quite a few of them. You know, I mean, housing problems, for example. I mean, why do people commit, why do people commit illegal acts? And you can't disconnect that from the fact that they're unhoused, from the fact that they're hungry. I mean, so, I, I mean, I think we have to keep a broader lens on this and not try to just narrow it down to policing. Okay. Because what we've seen historically, if we look at the last, say, 40 plus years in the United States, the era of mass incarceration, what we've seen is that policing and incarceration have seemed to be the solution to the crime problem. And those have been used as the solution to social problems more broadly. And if we don't move away from that analysis, we're going to keep doing that same thing. And I don't disagree with you, by the way, at all. I think you're correct. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. Sorry, I arrived late, so I missed the first part. I apologize if I'm missing anything that you said. I'm just wondering if would it be possible to de-emphasize the fire department element of this? Um, they're very important, but to my knowledge, Japan Fire Department has not uh, garnered public um, 
you know, outcry or criticism for having battered any president, for having given you know, false testimony, fabricated testimony, um, and uh, you know, exercising gender bias, uh, racial bias. It may well be that uh, reform is needed in the fire department, I, but my, I think my sense of our community's experience of the fire department is that they're doing a, great, a good to great job. Uh, however, that's not the case uh, in terms of our experience of uh, racial bias, gender bias, and uh, uh, use of force issues, civilian police review board issues uh, specific to Urbana. So I'm just, again, I apologize for arriving late, but I'm just wondering, could we kind of focus it, would it be possible for your study to focus more, like to do less of this kind of 50-50, uh, my feeling is we're doing like a 50-50, review of the two departments. Does that make sense? Well, I, I think I understand your comments. Um, no one's directing the conversation here. Folks are welcome to, to share and contribute disproportionately about police versus fire, or whatever. Um, again, uh, this is just an opportunity for people to talk to us about, again, um, positives or areas of growth for those service delivery models within, within the community. Um, and and um, in many ways, even though uh, police and fire are focal points of the project, there are very different analytics that go along with looking at um, fire response versus police response. Um, you know, fire departments are largely driven by geographic and staffing uh, levels and based on deployments and uh, their standards of coverage related to fire response for a variety of things, including uh, EMS, uh, by the way. And so um, there is a, there are points of analysis there, but they're in a very different lane from the points of analysis that we're talking about with the police department. So, um, you know, the project, uh, you know, if we were going to uh, put pen to paper and start saying what portion of this project relates to police versus fire, certainly there would be an, an offset in favor of percentage uh, toward the police but but of course uh, the, what the city has asked us to do is to look at both of those entities and so that's kind of the crux of the, of the approach so uh, yes, <coughs> go ahead <You> go. <coughs> Hi. I would like to see more um, sort of DEI engagement in both departments um, if you sort of look at the, the roster of both departments you'll see like an imbalance when it comes to like gender and um, racial diversity. So I think that that's something that, you know, the city should look to work on. Fantastic. And so if you didn't hear, there's a, there's a the comment was looking at, you know, various DEI um, aspects, uh, in, including um, diversity and, and race and gender within staffing levels within the different organizations. And just so you know, that is an area that we will look at. We will look at the, the counts. Um, we have comparative data that we, can, that we can bring into the conversation. And we'll also look at hiring practices and to what extent the, um, to what extent hiring within the public safety space seeks to add balance um, to uh, diversity and uh, particularly, you know, the gender, uh, gender and uh, other diversity within the within the department. So, absolutely, we are doing that. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to ask in your information gathering, how do you account for in any kind of study for people who maybe have the most uh, at stake or have been affected the most, are the ones that are going to talk small percentage <coughs> of the population opposed to the silent majority that seems to say nothing. What, you know, how can you tell in a meeting like this when there are 25 people here if, you know, there aren't folks that, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's not yeah, so I mean, at the end of the day, we just throw a dart at a dartboard and whatever it lands on that, I'm kidding, we don't do that. Um, we, obviously, we, we do this a lot, and we have conversations with folks a lot. And if you recall, I talked about uh, how we triangulate data and how we look at multiple data points 
to help us understand what the conditions are within a particular community. Um, it, it would probably shock you to see the amount of data requests that we've asked for from the, police, from the city. Uh, it's very extensive. There's a lot of existing data. There's data that they have to create. There's a number of worksheets and surveys and any number of different things that we do. And then there's also direct interviews with folks like yourself, interviews with staff, <coughs> interviews with community members and community groups. And at the end of the day, what we're really looking for are those commonalities that come together. The community survey that we will do is going to help in that regard uh, because that, um, despite, despite how much effort we put into advertising an event like this, um, the attendance varies greatly. Everybody's busy these days. Um, and so <clears throat> we will look at the online reporting. But the other piece of it is, again, we're going to look at the community survey that we distribute. And survey instruments that are, that are distributed across an entire community tend to get a better balance of all persons as opposed to those folks who might have a willingness to take an evening off and take a drive to somewhere and sit in a room like this for a couple hours and have a conversation. So um, that's not to discount the value of any of that information, but certainly our goal is to make sure that we have feedback that's relevant, that we can, that we can say, you know, this is, we can re rely on this information with a relative degree of reasonable accuracy based on who's responded. <clears throat> <coughs> you mentioned the sur a survey across the entire community. What, what steps have been taken or efforts undertaken to uh, disseminate uh, the information that the survey exists to, let's say, the African -Amer American communities in Urbana? Yeah, so uh, the survey has not been distributed yet. It hasn't even been developed yet. It's a it'll be a custom survey that we're, we're working on with the city. Um, we have already uh, begun uh, the process of um, identifying, I don't even know what the number is, um, any number of different community groups, um, whether they're uh, formal and informal community leaders, formal and informal groups, uh, individuals, uh, folks, some of you in here probably know people that are kind of the, the old term, the movers and shakers, right? The people that know people. And part of our approach is um, reaching out to those people and asking them, hey, listen, we're, we want to make sure we get everybody involved. How can you help us? Who else are we missing? Who else should we talk to? Uh, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called snowball sampling, if you're familiar with that. Um, and so we're looking at doing that. There's also going to be you know, direct communications from the city. It will be published on the website. It'll be you know, in a number of different areas. <coughs> the survey itself, <coughs> there will be multiple um, points of distribution in different formats and different forums. So, um, that is a, and it's part of why this process is rather lengthy because there's, there are a lot of steps to go through to help ensure that we get good penetration throughout the community, that folks know about it, and they know how to go about uh, filling it out. And, and uh, uh, again, whether, whether that's a paper form or whether that's something that's online um, and how they get to those links and so forth. So. I would like to suggest that the population that is going to be accessing online surveys is unlikely to be the population most impacted by policing and over-policing in our community. Okay. Okay. And so other ways need to be found to uh, reach out to them, communicate to them. These are uh, subgroups, if you will, that are not following city administration and city business. Yep. Yeah, we, we've had those conversations with the city already, and we're, we're already identifying those sources. <coughs> <coughs> yes? I want to emphasize that point again, um, making sure that we're purposefully with the survey reaching out to um, like leaders and just like the general community that are most affected by policing. Um, <coughs> Arrests and incarceration and police violence and brutality. Um, also, you know, uh, kind of going off of the comment from earlier about like the paradigm of sort of focusing strictly on like policing um, versus like the larger 
society and context. I think, you know, I have been thinking of examples of, you know, maybe they could satisfy like your, or, you know, the, the, the city's desire for like things that the police could do, um, or yeah, I guess that the government could do in general here in, in, just in the city government um, that are a bit more holistic, you know, that are good first step. Um, I mean, one fairly small but significant first step is like uh, implementing um, some kind of non-police response to uh, you know, unarmed like, uh, mental health or addiction crises. Um, like I know in San Francisco, uh, we're, sir, I'm going I'm oh, to ask yeah, you yeah. to stop for a second. We're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit, oh, sure. a little bit more in the meeting. <clears throat> okay. Um, we'll talk about that kind of on the second half of this, because um, there's some specific things that we're going to do about that in particular. I, I want to I go back to the general, other gentleman's comment, though, and to kind of the comment you made as well. Please don't misunderstand. The things that you're bringing up, the things that he was talking about, those are important. That's not what the city has asked us to do, okay? And so we have a certain, um, we have a certain amount of um, structure and effort to what we're providing to the city. That's not to say that the city won't want to come back later and say, gee, we really need to look at affordable housing and how we're dealing with that. Or we need to look at how we're dealing with our unhoused population. And, you know, what we're doing from a service perspective to, to tend to some of those folks. Some of that information is going to naturally funnel and filter into the work we're doing. Um, but again, some of those are broader social issues. Um, <clears throat> put this into perspective, in, uh, we just, we're just finishing up a project in Eugene, Oregon, which has the largest per capita unhoused population in the country. Um, and they're spending, as a community, somewhere around $20,000 a year on every unhoused person in their community. Uh, I believe San Francisco, I think in San Francisco, their number's closer to 35,000. So is that an issue? Absolutely. That, that piece for us was a nine month project all by itself, just looking at just that piece. So that's not to say that there aren't, those aren't important things, but they do fall a little bit outside of the scope of what we've been hired to do which is really to look more squarely at the police and fire kind of response pieces. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> um, so I heard you mention that you're going to have um, recommendations for mental health response and behavioral health response with the police department, but part of your data gathering will be looking at um, arrests depending on mental health or um, substance use and whether or not they were hospitalized or was there unnecessary incarceration for it. Is that data point you will be pulling from Urbana PD or? Those are detailed data points that are likely unavailable uh, without literally doing a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, what, what we will do, um, and, and what we're, we've already started, and part, again, part of that is for the conversation tonight, well, I keep delaying it. Without further ado, let me just talk a little bit about that rather than keep you all in suspense. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that's been happening across the country uh, is really challenging the traditional police and fire call for service response paradigm, right? Um, if you look, if you, if you go back in history, way back in history, and you look at what police and fire departments did, there was this little teeny tiny little list of things they did. And because we built within our communities full-time police and fire departments, what we did is we said, well, listen, here's something somebody needs to do, and Looks like the only people that are here after 4 p.m. is the police department, the fire department. Let's give it to them. And so <coughs> this has grown, right? Um, and <clears throat> so one of the things that we're being asked to do regularly around the country is to do what we call an essential call for service evaluation. And that involves a number of different steps. But the first step of that is to say, what do we go to? What's the list of calls that we go to? I can tell you right now, Everywhere we go, that list is somewhere between 250 and 350 different types of incidents that, that police and fire respond to, okay? Uh, and 
One of the first questions we want to ask is, does a police officer, a, a licensed sworn police officer, have to go to this call? Or not? Do we need to send the police to this call? Um, <clears throat> the answer might be no. In a lot of cases, the answer is yes. If it's, a, if it's an armed robbery, we probably want to send a police officer. If it's a, if it's a rape, we're probably going to send a police officer, right? Um, <clears throat> but if it's, um, if it's uh, a dumping complaint, do we need to send a police officer? Or could we send someone else to take care of that? Um, some of the more common categories that are coming out of these types of things uh, have to do with unhoused response. How are we dealing with the, how are we dealing with the homeless? Um, code enforcement is a big one. Uh, animal control is another one. Um, and probably the most prevalent and the one that people talk about the most is uh, mental health response. Um, as it happens, the city of Eugene has a program called CAHOOTS. <clears throat> it is the, uh, to my knowledge, the longest standing um, mental health crisis response program in existence. It's been around for three decades, um, and it's broken. Uh, because what happened to them what is the same thing that happened to the police. They created a crisis response team, and then they said, well, gee, these, they're not busy. Let's have them do this. Let's have them do this, and let's have them do this. They're now so busy doing all the other stuff that they're unavailable to do the mental health crisis response stuff a lot. So I literally just sent that report to them about a week ago saying, hey, you need to tell them to stop that. Stay focused on what the purpose is for that, okay? So when we talk about alternative response, what we're really looking at is how do we, uh, or how could communities uh, figure out how to manage volume in a different way rather than sending sworn officers. And that can happen in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, one of those ways is online reporting. Some of you may or may, or may not have been involved in this, but let me give you an example. Let's say that you came up, you got up this morning, you walked out to your car, and the window is smashed on your car in your driveway, and your $200 ray bans have been stolen out the dash. Okay? That's a theft. In most, in most communities, a theft, a criminal event, gets reported to the police. They send a police officer out. <clears throat> police officer comes right to report. Um, but let's talk, let's talk about what's not going to happen. There's no evidence to collect. There's not going to be any fingerprints anywhere. Nobody saw who was there unless, there's, unless somebody's got a ring camera or something else that picked them up, right? So um, we're not going to, even if we found your ray bands, we wouldn't know they were yours, <clears throat> you know, unless you had a personal engraved. So there's not a, not a great likelihood that that crime's gonna be solved, right? We're probably not gonna arrest somebody for that. <clears throat> but we still want it reported <coughs> because we want to watch for patterns in crime because it helps the police department understand where to deploy resources. So, could you, instead of having a police officer go to that, could you ask a community member, say, why don't you go online and fill out this report? Go to this portal, yep, select theft, theft from car, what's missing, this is what was, is there any evidence, no, you have any idea who did it, no, hit the send button, it goes out to the police department, you get a, you get a report number back, which if you've got comp and it's low enough and you can file a complaint with your insurance company, you can give them a case number, they can get a copy of the report, <clears throat> and all that stuff happens, right, without the need to tie up a police resource uh, who might be able to do something else. Yes, ma'am. Well, and what about the need to <clears throat> investigate or collect evidence that could disappear if someone is going to file an online portal? Yeah, so again, when, when online reporting is used, the department will go through a series of, um, these portals are set up in a way that says, for example, uh, is there evidence at the scene? If the answer is yes, you can't use online reporting. It'll stop you from going any further. Do you have an idea who did this? If you say yes, it's going to stop you and say, call the police department. If, you, if, you, if it says, is your property traceable or was this a firearm? It's going to say, stop, call the police department. Okay? 
So these, these systems are set up in a way, they're very structured so that, again, only those crimes that fall into that really kind of no additional action needed type thing are going to funnel their way all the way through the system. It's been a number of years since I saw this data, but San Francisco was one of the first police departments to, to move to an online reporting model, and they were reporting that something like 17% of their volume was, was now coming through online reporting. And keep in mind that when you do that, <clears throat> imagine, and the number varies, but imagine that the average incident within a police department takes about 45 minutes to handle, give or take. And, there's, and it depends on whether it's service or motor vehicle crash or crime. It, it really kind of varies by community. But across the country, it's a pretty close number. So <clears throat> if someone goes online, creates this report, and it comes into the police department, um, you've eliminated that 45 minute time investment the police department had to do, right? When we do staffing analysis, we're looking at encumbered time or what we call obligated time. And in our world, obligated time means someone called the police, and that means from the time that the dispatcher sent the police officer till they got there, did all their business, and said, I'm done with this call, that's what we call obligated time, because the police department's obligated to take care of that incident, right? So if we can eliminate that 45 minutes, and we can eliminate that 1,280 times this year, right? That number adds up very quickly and it translates into more efficient operations and a need for less staffing, right? <clears throat> so that's, so online reporting is one. Another one is something called uh, a TRU or telephone responding, telephone reporting unit. Uh, it's very much exactly what you would think it would be. Uh, <clears throat> it really is, for all intents and purposes, it's the same as online reporting, except you're talking to a live person. And that person is gonna start taking your information, and they're gonna ask you some questions, and if you say there was a firearm that was taken, they're gonna say, okay, now they may be able to say, do you have the serial number, do you have all this information, and they may be able to walk you through that. If they can, fine. Uh, they may do that, take that information, put it in the system, hit send, that may go to a supervisor who looks at it and says, we better have somebody follow up on this, Let's send this over to investigations who send the detective out the next day or whatever that might be. So online reporting is one very good passive method. And by the way, in best practices, all online reports funnel into a review queue as well. It's not just that they go into the abyss, right? They come into a review queue, somebody looks at them and says, do we have all the requisite information here? And if we don't, what are we missing? And if, we, if we're really missing something, then we get, up, we get to outreach to this person, right? The same thing happens on a with a TRU. All that information comes in, it gets dumped into the record system, ultimately it gets reviewed, it, it either gets closed or it gets funneled off for additional investigation. Um, <clears throat> the, another category, <clears throat> and I just learned this morning that um, U of IPD has this, and that is, um, we call community service officers. You may have heard them called different things, but these are, <clears throat> These are typically uniformed police personnel, but they're non-sworn, they don't carry a firearm. Most police departments have them dressed differently, so they're easily distinguishable by the public as not being police officers. More often than not, they're driving cars that say community service officer or some other uh, distinguishing characteristic on them. And <clears throat> these individuals can do many things that police officers can do, but they can do the things we don't need the police to do. For example, if we have a motor vehicle crash, let's say we send a police officer to a motor vehicle crash and the car is disabled and we need to wait for a tow truck. We don't need a police officer to sit there. We can have a CSO sit there and wait with the tow truck until the tow truck gets there. And we can free up that officer to go do whatever else they need to do. Uh, traffic control, we get a signal light that's burnt out, right? <clears throat> we're gonna, we're gonna we're going to send a bunch of cops there to direct traffic. Hey, let's let's give a CSO to do that. So that's another lane that goes into this process. Um, <clears throat> then there's then there's a couple of other angles. One is um, alternative resources. I mentioned cahoots. Um, it stands for. No, I can't think of it. I know. 
Crisis assistance helping, assistance helping, out, on helping out on the streets. That's what it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you don't know this, Cahoots is an independently, they are, they are a private entity. They're run by Whitebird Clinic out of Eugene. Um, they, in, for Cahoots, their model is they send, they have, a, they have vans, which by the way, <coughs> are owned by the city. Um, they have vans and there's always a mental health practitioner and a uh, trained medical personnel <coughs> at a minimum at the EMT level or higher, okay, emergency medical technician. <coughs> Those, those units um, in, in the model that Eugene uses, those units go out either um, independently. And by the way, there's different iterations of this, right? People do this in different ways in the country. Um, but for Eugene, if they call dispatch and dispatch goes through their protocol, if you don't know this, when you call dispatch, they have a, they've got a questionnaire and if you answer B, it goes over to this lane. And if you answer C, it goes over to this lane. And they go through this thing to get done. And they say, hey, you know what? We don't think there's a danger factor here. This is a person who's probably in crisis. But we don't need to send the police. We're just going to send cahoots only. That's who we're sending. We're not going to send the police at all. Now, if the police get there and they say, uh, hey, this is, this is getting a little squirrely. They can call the police in to assist. Same kind of thing happens with the fire department. So <clears throat> in Eugene, there's really kind of three ways this happens. Cahoots goes by themselves, or um, in some cases, Cahoots will go there and then police or fire will show up, or in some cases, police and fire will get there and realize this is really a Cahoots call, let's call them and we'll have them come do that. So it's not restricted only to mental health. There are other things that we could outsource. For example, um, <clears throat> alarms. How many of you have a, an alarm at your home or business? Anybody? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> there is the statistical data on alarms is that that well into the 90 percentile are false alarms. And most of the time when we go to an alarm, there's nothing wrong at all. Somebody had a balloon floating around in their house, you know, or uh, you know, an employee came in and didn't know the code at the business or whatever that might be. Um, more and more police departments are outsourcing some of those alarm responses and saying. Look, if this is a, if this is uh, if it's not a hold up alarm, right? Uh, if it's not a hold up alarm or a duress alarm, <clears throat> we're not going to directly respond if it's unmonitored, for example. And that's just that's just an example. There's all kinds of different iterations. Some communities have gone to hiring security to do for to do primary response on alarms. Um, but again, the idea here is to, uh, and this is really the point of. The, the larger point about alternative call for service response is this, very simply. Let's send the right resource. Not every, not everything, we don't need to pound in a nail with a sledgehammer every time. Let's send the right resource, the right cost resource. We know that CSOs, for example, generally we can hire CSOs at about somewhere between 60 to 70% of what a police officer costs. So when you start to think about the numbers of volume, uh, we're doing a project in Connecticut right now. <clears throat> we would have recommended hiring 21 officers, but instead we're recommending hiring 13 CSOs and eight police officers. So there, those are the things that happen when we start looking at and cascade down this, all of this list of different calls and understanding um, how that volume translates into obligated workload, right? So if we can relieve, if we can relieve workload from the police, we can again divert that into multiple different places, ultimately mitigating the need to, we don't need to expand the police department, right? If we can take 20 or 30 percent of their workload and shuffle it over to somewhere else appropriately, then that means that the officers have more time to dedicate to those issues that really require their more prompt and, and detailed attention. So <clears throat> the, last, the last bucket on the call for service list is stuff we just shouldn't do at all, right? It's, hey, this is something somebody asked us to do. I'm not sure we should do this anymore. Uh, it, it maybe isn't even our function to do that. 
um, maybe we should have another entity. Uh, <coughs> another good example <coughs> of that that I use, anybody ever locked their keys in the car? Right, right? So once upon a time in my police department, if you lock your keys in your car and you call us, we'd come and lock your car for you, okay? Of course, we made you sign your life away, promising you not to sue us if we wrecked your car trying to open, open the door. But, um, but we, would, we would come and do it. Um, but it got to the point where we were doing several of these a week. And it just got to be so onerous. We just couldn't continue to do it. And so we said, you know what? There's two very capable uh, towing companies in town that will come and unlock your car. Um, so one of the things that we, that we tell police firms is, <clears throat> we don't want you to just stop doing things. If you're gonna stop doing something, help people understand what the resource is that, that fills in that blank hole that you just made, right? So if somebody calls, what if you call and say, I'm locked my keys in my car, the dispatcher shouldn't say, sorry, we don't do that anymore, click, right? They should say, hey, you know, police department doesn't do that. There's a couple of different towing companies in town. Would you like me to forward you to one of them, right? Or do you have AAA? You know, they'll come do it for you or whatever. So, um, so those are all kind of the different, that's a, a rather lengthy explanation of what this looks like. One of the things we're gonna ask you to do as a community, anybody that's in here and anybody else that's uh, out in the community, <clears throat> we're gonna ask you to go onto the Social Pinpoint site and fill out a questionnaire. And the questionnaire is gonna ask you things like, how would you feel about using online reporting for this type of a call? Or how would you feel about using a telephone reporting unit for this type of call? Or how would you feel about a uh, non-sworn field response person coming to take this type of call? How would you feel about outsourcing this? Oh, and by the way, <clears throat> for any of these types of calls, do you have any ideas on who else could do this? Who else do you know in this area that does this kind of stuff? That we could that we could think about collaborating with, and and peeling off some of that volume into another area. Okay, so um, this happens in a series of stages, right? So the first thing is getting all the data from from what we call the CAD system or the CAD data, the computer aided dispatch system. So if you're not familiar with that, if you call 911, it creates a computer record. There's all kinds of information that goes along with that. Date, time, who responded to it, how long it took them to get there, how long they spent there, all of that stuff. The nature of the call, geographic coordinates, all of that. <clears throat> so once we get that information, we can go down, create this list. We go through a series of evaluation process with the police department to isolate which ones are open to some other alternative, right? Again, there's gonna be things like aggravated robbery. We're not gonna ask the public if we should send someone else to that. Okay, we're gonna send the police to that. So we're gonna go through that list, and when we're done with that, we're gonna build that list into a survey, and that's what's gonna go out to the community. And once that happens, um, we will take all that data and compile it, <clears throat> and bring it back to the police department and say, okay, here's what, here's what the community's telling us about their <coughs> um, level of comfort with these different types of responses, and let's now think about what do we want to put in place? What kind of protocols do we need to put in place? How are we going to educate, dispatch, police officers, the community? How are we going to educate the community about, about the availability of these resources? And um, how, how are we going to direct the community to those resources? So there's a, there's a, as you might imagine, there's a fair amount of pieces to this puzzle to put together at the end of the day. So having said all of that, I'm going to take a breath. <clears throat> and I'm just going to ask you, <coughs> what are your thoughts about what I just described and using alternative uh, resources to respond to various call for service types? Anyone have a thought? Yes, sir. I, I have a thought, mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's kind of like a philosophical thing. I <clears throat> hope it doesn't come off wrong, but I know in the past there's been this idea of community policing, the idea that the police should be out in the community and every time they help someone open their car door or get a cat out of a tree, they're actually building relationships with the community. 
And it sounds a little bit like this is going like in the exact opposite direction where you'd be actually taking the armed response officers and increasingly isolating them from having any kind of non-armed response contact with the community, which actually, you know, ironically makes me worry that these people aren't going to know who's involved in these disputes and they might not be able to walk mm -hmm. in there and know everyone by name. And so just like at the philosophical level, it's almost like that's a that's a very astute and legitimate concern. And one of the things is, um, and by the way, <clears throat> and I'm not I'm not giving away any details. This this is public information. But one of the things we observed in Eugene was that people said the only time the police show up is when something bad's about to happen. And so, right. So this idea, this idea that um, this idea that the police are and it's a horrible word, but they're kind of an enemy, if you will, right? <clears throat> uh, uh, a, a group of people not, not to be excited about seeing, right? <clears throat> we, we certainly don't want to perpetuate that. So your point is well made. It's not that they won't do any of that, and they will do those kind of things. And in fact, quite frankly, <clears throat> our model, <coughs> the national standard for police response is Everybody ready for this? You can write this down if you want. We separate, we separate police activity, police patrol activity into three buckets, okay? The first one is obligated workload. Remember what I said? That's from the time the dispatch calls them till the time they finish the call. No more than 30% of the officer's time should be spent on obligated workload, okay? The next bucket is what we call administrative workload. That's in-service training. It's shift briefings. It's follow-up. It's report writing. It's emails. All of that other stuff <clears throat> that goes into the work that they have to do. <clears throat> the last bucket is uh, for officer-initiated activity. And, no, and we really want to have 30% for officer-initiated activity. Okay. Are there any math people in here figured out the problem with my equation? Anybody find this yet? Because <laughs> cops always miss this. No, I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> the idea is really that last bucket, we want a minimum of 30%. There's a 10% buffer. <clears throat> we know on any given day, there's going to be a, there's going to be peaks and valleys in obligated um, workload. So <clears throat> essentially we're saying it really should be 30-30-30. This 10% ideally would be routinely allocated to officer-initiated activity, which includes, intentionally includes, direct community outreach, problem-solving, community-oriented policing activities that are non-enforcement oriented. But here's what we find. In most police departments, <clears throat> um, the first bucket is wrong. Most police departments have anywhere from 35 to 40 percent of the officer's time is being spent in the obligated workload category. <clears throat> the second bucket, the administrative bucket, is extremely difficult to calculate because we don't write it down. <laughs> Nobody knows how long we spent writing reports or how long we did, we did spending emails or phone calls or follow-up, all that kind of stuff. But we know from a lot of just anecdotal evidence that number tends to mirror the first number. So if you're sitting at a 40% obligated workload, you probably have a 40% um, administrative workload. Anybody in here currently employed or ever been employed? <laughs> How many of you had this happen? You're supposed to be done working at 4.30. It's 3.30, and you've, you've, got, you've cleaned everything up for the day, right? <clears throat> You've got an hour left, and you want to do something else, and you go, I only got an hour. I don't have enough time to do this. All right? I'll take care of that tomorrow. Anybody do that? When the obligated and administrative workload buckets get too big, cops stop doing proactive activity and community policing. They stop doing it because they, get, they convince themselves that there's not enough time to do any of it, which means they do less and less and less of it to the point where they almost do none of it. Um, and a lot of police departments, by the way, create community policing units which 
are okay, but kind of work against the concept of that community policing should be an operational philosophy that permeates the organization. Every person within the organization should be doing community policing, not just a select few that are dedicated to this unit. So to your point, you're correct. However, if it's done correctly, here's what happens. Everything I just talked to you about, about the central call for service, takes that 40% bucket down to 30%, shrinks this 40% bucket down to 30, and all of a sudden, we now we have 30 to 40% of our time left over to do these things that we need to be doing to build trust relationships with our community, build and sustain trust relationships with our community, right? And so, um, a lot of organizations are really struggling with that last bucket because they're so strapped for work. Now I can tell you we, we have not had the opportunity to look at Urbana's data yet, but <clears throat> based on conversations with staff, I expect that we're gonna find those two buckets are very high uh, and that they're struggling against those numbers. Um, we're doing this project up in Connecticut. <clears throat> they are, their average response time from the time someone calls to the time an officer shows up, okay? This is across all their calls. The average response time is three hours. And some change, okay? <clears throat> How big is their bucket? It's really big, okay? And there's some other reasons for that. But the point of all that is, when that happens, it starts to deteriorate community, community confidence. The people stop calling. And what happens is now the police are uninformed about the, about the true nature of crime and where it's occurring within the community, which reduces their effectiveness. And now you start to see crime rates creep because the, the police aren't equipped with the information they need to appropriately deal with some of those pieces. So, um, <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Sorry, I just wanted to offer a slightly different perspective. <clears throat> so, I really, I believe that community trust and relationships are, are built and strengthened by good policing when the community calls on police and needs the police to be present. You know, no matter how many relationships or activities are done outside of those calls, if those calls feature gender bias or escalation of, of what's it called? Escalation? Force? Es mm. Yeah, when you escalate the conflict, mm -hmm. uh, if those calls feature bias of any kind and um, you know unwarranted use of force or, or bad judgment, that's where you lose community trust. I don't. I couldn't. Feel, I couldn't agree with you more. Right. So I, I feel like that percentage, that thirty percent of police officer acti mm -hmm. community activity, I don't see that as as important. Like, give them the time to write the reports and. Frankly, fill in that 30% with education and training modules. And I also feel like maybe, uh, you know, police officers could be given incentives um, to connect uh, with the community outside of work if they so choose and feel like it. For example, they might be a great softball coach. We've got, like, a lot of our police officers live in bedroom communities. They, they coach teams in Muhammad, in St. Joseph. Why not come into Urbana? And if you enjoy coaching, do that or some other kind of activity. But I don't think it should be mandatory. Does that make sense? It does. There's some. There are some FLSA standards with some the challenges with some of that stuff. And I would say this: um, part of what you're talking about in terms of interactions at incidents relates to the ideas of procedural justice and social justice and how those interactions are occurring with each and every incident and contact. That's the baseline, okay? That's not community policing, that's the baseline. That's, that's human dignity, um, treating people with dignity and respect, giving them voice in the encounter, understanding what they're trying to, what they're hoping to have occur, being genuinely in the moment with that person, and, and letting them drive the outcomes at the end of that incident. All of those things, and the things that you're talking about, the negative things you're talking about, absolutely should not occur, okay? But let's talk about <clears throat> community policing. By the way, yeah, and this is not a great statistic for our industry, but when I go to police departments, I always interview the officers and say, what is community policing? And basically, however many officers I interview, that's how many different definitions I get, okay? 
And I bet if I was to ask all of you what community policing is, I would get an equally uh, varied number. Community policing is about, it's about relationship building, but it's also about working in concert with the community. It's about problem solving. It's about, it's about um, something called problem-oriented policing, right? Where we look at it and we say, instead of me just coming to your store for the 12th time saying, why do we keep coming back here? Not because of what you're doing, but what's going on environmentally here that we can help you change? Let's take a step back here and let's, let's talk about this. What's going on? Well, gee, it sure seems like this one clerk is always working every time this comes, this happens, right? Well, maybe there's a connection between the people that are showing up and doing some of this, right? So there's, <clears throat> there's this idea that we call that meaningful community policing. In a lot of organizations, we'll say, do you believe in community policing? I say, yep. We go, great. Um, do you track it? And they go, what? I say, do you track the activity? Do you know how much time your officers spend doing community policing? And they go, well, we, they go to events. OK, is that, is that your definition of what community policing is? is, that, is and even if it is, um, are you even tracking that? Is it part of your performance appraisal system? Right? What, is, what do we really believe in from a community policing perspective? If we want our officers to engage in meaningful community policing, one of the things we need to break down is this is what I call fractionalism. This it's this idea that we're the police and you're not, right? It's not about us being opposite or in different buckets. We're all in the same community. How do we how do we break that down and say we're we're together in this initiative? And we do that certainly one call at a time, like you're talking about. <clears throat> but when we start doing <coughs> problem-oriented policing and project activities. What we start to find is that communities all of a sudden start to see the police in a different light. And we start seeing things like a call that says, I have this problem. Can you come and do uh, an environmental survey of my store? Because I seem to have a lot of issues here. Or a safety survey of my property. Or maybe there's an apartment complex that's had a lot of thefts from vehicles, <clears throat> for example. And how can we address that? Those things don't occur unless or until we, we place significant value on um, that meaningful policing kind of activity. And unless or until we create a space and an opportunity for officers to engage in it. <clears throat> so you're right. That, none of that bad stuff you talked about should be happening. And there should be a lot of good stuff happening. And if it's not, then that's, a, that's an issue to deal with. But, um, but I would argue that <clears throat> the discretionary time that's left over um, certainly should be dedicated toward community policing, but there's another thing that we don't, haven't really talked about, and that's what we call intelligence-led policing, which is all about understanding where is crime? Where is it happening? And why? And who's involved? And how can we dedicate, how can we take our resources and dedicate those resources that we call hotspots, right, where we see criminal volume? And how do we go out and deal with that? Well, it doesn't have to be arrests. It can be educational. It can be all kinds of different things. But again, if we don't, if we don't free up the space for that time, it's just not going to occur. So I did, yeah, go ahead. So we have an organization here called the Community Coalition, which all the police chiefs kind of meet and give monthly presentations and stuff. And I've been following those for years. And one thing that has come up over and over for years is one of the reasons the police feel they can't solve crimes is because they don't have witnesses who are willing to speak with them. And the reason is those people don't trust the police. So all of the good <laughs> things that you've said today are immediately destroyed anytime the public or members of the public witness the police doing something bad, engaging in misconduct, using unnecessary violence. They're destroyed for years, for a generation perhaps, every time these instances <clears throat> accrue. And I haven't heard you really say anything about how to handle those things. And it's not just that the bad thing happened. It's that what happens next is the police department in the city denies that anything bad happened. And so we've triply destroyed trust. And I, I haven't heard you go into that area at all. All, all the positive things you're saying are just destroyed by those events. Well, I, I would, 
Um, I'll use a metaphor, okay? Um, and we do this sometimes when we do training. We take a plate, and we say, this is community trust, right? An actual, like a real plate, not like one of those Corral ones. I mean, a, you know, a real plate, right? You know what I'm talking about? We take the plate, wrap a towel around it, and smash it with a hammer. And we open it up and we say, <clears throat> this is community trust. And you see how it's broken? Can we put this back together? Maybe. But if you've ever tried to put something like that back together, you know what happens, right? There's a little piece here or there that's been fully destroyed. There's cracks, there's chinks, there's all those kind of things. <clears throat> there is an, an undisputable history of marginalization that's been done at the hands of the police. There can be no question about it. That's accurate. Marginalization has resulted in um, <clears throat> has resulted in fractured trust relationships with, particularly with <clears throat> traditionally marginalized communities. Okay. The question becomes, how do you rebuild trust? And, I, and by the way, I would say I would suggest that. Um, <clears throat> an officer doing something bad doesn't necessarily destroy or negate everything, but it definitely works against it. And if you have enough of those negative things occurring, <coughs> ultimately you have a deficit, right? And when, that's, when the police trust department <clears throat> says that the officer didn't do something bad, well, then, then it, then it you, becomes a structural... Uh, I don't disagree with you. If, if, if police departments don't take ownership over the bad things, that, that tends to elevate for others that there's that um, that they don't get it, right so there's a whole different bucket here related to um, something called community co-production policing um, and you may or may not have heard of co-production policing it's not a well-known um, process <clears throat> but if you if you've ever looked at the uh, president's 21st century policing commission that president obama commissioned uh, the 21st Century Policing Report. There's a section in there, and it's a, it's a little teeny little section, and if you're not careful, you'll miss it. But in that section, it talks about how the police should co-produce public safety with the community, as opposed to doing things to or for the community. And there's a really big distinction there. And if you, if you, we'll take a little bit of a walk here back to, I talked about community policing. <clears throat> One of the mainstays of community policing was community engagement, right? We're going to have meetings with the community. We're going to talk to the community. Uh, now, I'm not talking about Urbana. I can't, I can't speak to that at this point, but I will say police departments in general have gone up and done that and then gone back to the police department and did what they were planning on doing anyway, irrespective of what the community said. And what does that do to the community's view of the police when we just gave you all this information and you went back and you did what you did something different anyway, right? <clears throat> why did we waste our time having those conversations? Why are why are uh, marginalized communities underrepresented in meetings like this? Well, a lot of it is because there's such a lack of trust in the system that many folks in marginalized communities say it's not worth my time. They're not going to they're not going to respond to what I say anyway. They're not going to do anything about it. Yeah. <coughs> They're also traumatized. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, the difference in co-production is this. And the best analogy I can give you to, to illustrate this for you is this. We've already established all of you either have or do work. Okay. If there's going to be a policy change that's going to significantly affect how you do your job, okay? Would you like to be involved in the decision about what that policy is gonna say? How many of you would like to be involved in that? Well, let me ask you this. If the police department is gonna substantively change how they police the community, should the community have an influential voice over what that looks like? And that's the difference. Community policing opened up a lot of conversations. 
but in many cases, it didn't result in meaningful influence over the outcomes. So the cornerstone of co-production policing is understanding that our engagement with the community should involve a bona fide interest and influence over the outcomes based on what the community has to say. Now, don't mistake me, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean the police department is going to go out and just blanket ask the community and just go implement what the community says, because there might be very good reasons for not doing that. But it should influence that process, and in many cases it doesn't. To your point, everybody knows how quickly we can destroy trust, and everybody knows how long it takes to build it. We can't build trust in one minute or one call or even one month, but we can start. But it has to start with, <clears throat> it has to start with the ability, and again, this goes back to this whole <clears throat> um, call for service piece that I was talking about. Let's send the right resources to these things. Let's make sure we're sending trained personnel to mental health calls so that we don't end up escalating a call to the point where force has to be used unnecessarily, and now someone gets injured or killed as a result of it. Right? Let's think about <clears throat> if we're dealing with a, a minor neighborhood dispute, do we really need to send an armed officer with a gun to go deal with that? Or can we have somebody who understands how to have a conversation? By the way, I, have any of you noticed, anybody in here kids? Have you noticed, have you noticed the thumb biceps on your kids? You know what I mean? They're doing like this, right? They get a little thumb biceps. Anybody notice this? One of the things we're losing as a, as, as a nation is our ability to interact with each other and communicate in interpersonal communications. And by the way, police departments aren't immune to this, right? They're, they're people just like everyone else. And so we need to help teach our officers how to be good interpersonal communicators and ultimately, we need to send the right resources to these calls and we need to make sure they're trained and they understand how to do those things as well. Moving, <coughs> correcting trust. If every police department, <clears throat> if there was a magic solution and every police department started implementing today, it would still take a very, very long time to repair the damage that occurred. <clears throat> However, with every additional step that we take in the right direction, it creates the opportunity for that trust to continue to build. But it has to be, and this is what we, this is what we um, espouse in our work, it has to be intentional, it has to be cultural, it has to permeate the organization. It's not a project to be achieved. It's a mentality and a focus and a culture that we want to indoctrinate with everybody that comes through the door until they leave the organization. And, um, and again, there are a variety of strategies that help us get there. And that doesn't mean it's easy, I, I agree with you. It's, it, there are significant challenges. Um, but you'll never be able to rebuild the plate. At some point, we can get it to a point, but when you look at it on the mantle, you're still going to remember and see that there's cracks in that plate somewhere. Did you have another question to comment? Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was counting the number of times that you used the word accountability, and I think it was zero. It, I'm a little worried about kind of just always reverting back to coffee with the cop is going to patch things up. But, and if we have a police officer shoot someone, you know, unnecessarily, Coffee with a cop doesn't fix that. You now have another generation of people who, uh, supposing this was an incident where there was no accountability, which we've seen, you know, in here. Sure. I, I don't feel like you entered that space to talk about what that looks like or what it should look like. Well, I mean, um, first of all, let me say that the conversation hasn't necessarily taken us there, but certainly accountability is a key factor. And, um, you know, our, our, our industry has traditionally been poor at accountability. 
Um, and that has changed, starting to change. Is it completely done? No. Are we seeing more and more organizations holding people accountable for their behavior? Yes. Uh, is that fixed? No. Um, but certainly we need good systems of accountability and those systems need to, um, those systems need to also contribute to building sustaining trust within our communities, across our entire community, but also in particular with, in particular, those folks who again have been traditionally marginalized or those that are um, aggrieved, uh, particularly aggrieved by some circumstance. Yeah. <clears throat> in terms of uh, accountability and public trust, I think um, having a an empowered civilian police review board would be a you know step in that. I know that the FOP was actively like um, basically trying to keep higher and firing power out of the urban civilian police review board um, and was basically like a few uh, in their like proposed um, contract with like, like a few of the points we kind of have the civilian police review board under that contract like be stipulated for different things um, that they wanted the uh, basically protections for uh, like what is it like, like the opposite of transparency for police officers in um, you know, who are under investigation for, uh, or, or I assume they, they accused of, of uh, police brutality or, 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 or any kind of misconduct, threat misconduct. Um, and so. Well, let me, let me respond to that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that um, one of the one of the pieces of the project we're doing involves looking at CPRB. Yeah. Uh, we actually had some interviews today with department staff about that. We got a series of interviews with folks on the board tomorrow uh, to talk with them about uh, what their role, what it looks like, um, what uh, you know. We're we're hearing that there is a desire to see an expanded role and some shifts and changes in that board. Um, obviously, we haven't talked to those individuals yet, but. Part of our process involves having those conversations and then also looking at what, what is the goal we're trying to accomplish, right? I will tell you this, and I say this regularly. <clears throat> My firm and me personally, I don't have a proclivity to using one or not using one, okay? We, we don't promote, we don't say, gee, you should have one or gee, you shouldn't have one. What we say is, if you have one, is it working? What, do you, what is your goal? What's the purpose? Why do we have one? What's its purpose? And is it, is it performing its purpose? Is, is the nature and structure and function of your unit performing the purpose? And, and <clears throat> is the purpose it was created still the same as what we want it to be? I mean, a lot of these boards were created decades ago. And <coughs> Things have changed, right? So um, the bigger question is, let's be, let's be clear what we want this board to do, what do we want its function to be, and then let's look at what, does, what do we need in order for those things to occur. I will tell you that, um, you know, if you talk to the folks from NACOL, which is kind of the, over the umbrella over all the civilian review kind of boards, you know, they will tell you there's, there's not one specific model that, that they come out and say, gee, this is the model. Uh, and and for, for us, we follow the same path. Let's be clear as a community what you're trying to accomplish, and let's talk about whether you have the structure to get there, and if you don't, let's talk about what needs to change in order for that to occur. So, that is a piece of what we'll do. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Um, in addition to some of the accountability, transparency, and equity that we've talked about, another thing that I'm interested in is decentralizing some of the power of the police department in particular, um, as far as creating policy, handling complaints, and discipline oversight is the way I understand it completely on the leadership, the chief of police, and some limited executive, and not open to the public or even council or the boards and commissions. 
Um, so I was wondering, um, and other examples too, that we have this whole bigger system. We talked about CPRB, we also have the Human Relations Commission mm -hmm. that in their ordinance say that they're supposed to review the affirmative action hiring policies of the city, although to my understanding, we don't have affirmative action, affirmative action hiring policies. So I guess the, the question is, um, if you plan to look into some of those existing policies and structures and all those different pieces and have some recommendations for how to manage those different pieces. Well, we're certainly, as I said, we're certainly going to look at CPRB, the function and its structure. Um, and I can tell you right now, just based on initial conversations, there's things within the ordinance that aren't being done. That It says this is what you're supposed to do and there's things that aren't being done. So. We already know there's work there to be done to, to improve those conditions. Um, the, but again, back to your point, um, in terms of decentralization, that kind of thing, um, there are a variety of different models that can be used to do that. Um, you know, we will look at what, again, what the desires of the community are and, and look at what the potential structure of CPRB ought to be going forward. Again, whether it's working, whether it's not working, um, and, and, you know, try to isolate that and, you know, follow that with recommendations on, on what to change or what not to change, frankly. Other thoughts about, you know, alternative service? We talked a little bit about this. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> Can we talk about domestic violence? Sure. Okay, so you mentioned... I'm against it. You mentioned It's a bad that. thing. Okay. <clears throat> um, so you mentioned that, Matt mental health response incidents are the most prevalent. Um, wh where would you posit domestic violence uh, calls? My uh, understanding is it's pretty high as well. Domestic Generally and locally. <coughs> domestic violence calls in police departments, um, if you break it down, and, and police departments do this in different ways, um, <clears throat> sometimes you get a category, a call for service category of domestic, um, and sometimes that includes all domestics. Sometimes you have a category that says domestic, and then you have another one that says domestic violent. You might have another one that says domestic weapon, or any number of different things. <clears throat> if, we take, if we take domestic calls, including those that don't result in an arrest, okay, it comes in as a domestic disturbance. And just so we're clear, you know, <clears throat> three kids fighting in the alley is a disturbance. That's not a domestic. A disturbance at home is a domestic if there, if there is uh, a significant relationship between the people that are involved, okay? So if we look at domestics as a category in, in some, they tend, the volume in police departments tends to be somewhere in that top five six, maybe seven of the total volume of responses that police departments do. <clears throat> so, um, but again, and this goes back to one of the pieces of, of calls for service, okay? Let's take, let's take, um, let's take check the welfare. Many, many organizations have a call type called check the welfare. Check the welfare could mean Build in shelter for work for the past two days. That's a, that's a check the welfare call. Um, there's a person lying in the alley. There's a person laying on a park bench. There's a person having a mental health crisis. <clears throat> so one of the things that we want to help organizations do is in those circumstances where they have generic call for service types, we want to be able to break those down so that it's clearer which of these relate to these specific categories because we can't successfully divert them unless we're clear what those are. <clears throat> we need to really understand what are domestics. There's a difference between an argument <coughs> and, and an intimate partner domestic, right? <clears throat> I'll give you an example. We had uh, an instance where a 12-year-old threw a full can, an open can of pop at a sibling with the intent to hit them with it, hurt them. In Minnesota, 
That's domestic violence, and it's a shallow arrest circumstance. Take him to jail. How many think that's the right remedy? It's not, right? So, so we, we need to understand and be able to clarify what that looks like. And we also need to look at um, kind of what are the domestic violence protocols that the organization's using? Um, are they using lethality assessment? Everybody, anybody here not familiar with, everybody heard of that term before, lethality assessment? You know what that is? <clears throat> There's significant research, uh, I believe it came out of Maryland, um, and there are identifiable factors that, when present, increase the likelihood of serious assault or homicide of an intimate partner in a subsequent event, okay? So, when a police department, a best practice for police departments is to go to a, go to a domestic incident, walk through a questionnaire that isolates the intimate partner violence lethality assessment protocol, okay, and if the, if the score is high enough, the, the Maryland model calls for the police department to literally call an advocate right then and there on the scene and put the, put the victim together with an advocate in the hopes that that person is gonna seek services. Many, I'm sure many of you know this, but many domestic violence victims are very reluctant to call in the first place, and a lot of times the police get there because somebody else called or what have you, um, and these people are very reluctant oftentimes the next day. But if we get them connected with an advocate right out of the gate, the advocate can follow up on that with them. They're, get, they're starting to, they've got a level of comfort and they're starting to build a relationship. So there's a whole bunch of pieces that go into the whole DV space, yeah. Well, that's exactly <clears throat> what I want to recommend. So as a domestic <clears throat> violence survivor and whose um, situations was, were handled uh, initially and for quite some time by the Urbana Police Department, I can say that I can say many things, but for example, when you're in that situation, you're told to call 911. That's it. There are no alternatives. It might be 11 p.m. There's no advocate available, at least maybe there are now or there could be, but you call 911. My experience was the police officers in the moment, I didn't understand it, I didn't see it. What I can tell you, they were not um, prepared, they were not um, informed, they were not trained, they were not educated, and so they fall back on gender bias. They fall back on the lead of the partner who is calm, calmest, calmest if that's a word, the most calm, the most convincing, the most persuasive. You mentioned domestic violence uh, victims or survivors tend to not want to, well, mm -hmm. tend to not want to reach out. We don't. And we also don't even want to call 911. And when you're there, we don't want to make a big deal of it. We want everything to stop and we want you to go away. And we want the situation to end. Um, sorry, I'm off track, but um, my point is police officers in my, certainly my own experience, are not uh, equipped to handle, um, you know, this is a, it requires specialized skills and understanding to respond to, i.e. domestic violence professionals. So I highly uh, urge, well first of all I urge that very done, uh, look very, very uh, substantially and very carefully at family violence and that to include child abuse, uh, not just intimate partner abuse, uh, and, and, and um, um, assess and, and uh, evaluate um, what I would say is a broken response model and um, strongly recommend a family justice center be um, established here. Those are alternative, uh, innovative, uh, response models that are proven, proven to work and to be effective. They handle uh, the situation a lot uh, faster, a lot more efficiently, and ideally can respond to the needs of all parties. And there's a nexus between mental health and domestic violence, uh, mm -hmm. certainly for perpetrators, and, and also substance uh, abuse or abuse. So this is a, a, like a prime example of a scenario where a multiple angle 
uh, support and response is very needed. <coughs> and police officers, certainly in Urbana, receive little to zero training in domestic violence, in gender bias. I've spoken with uh, professionals at our local agencies, domestic <coughs> violence agencies, and they've told me that the Urbana Police Department uh, engagement with them in terms of <coughs> asking for training input uh, to learn about, you know, response, um, you know, training uh, is, is, is like zero or close to it. So these are I, I would say this big that, issue. Let me just say that um, the policing industry is behind the curve on understanding trauma-informed policing. Yeah. Uh, and, and how we how we approach um, instances without revictimizing victims and without adding trauma to the circumstance. And so um, those are good points. Those are things that absolutely are, are part of the equation. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I think that just goes back to your overarching theme of providing the correct resource to the situation um, instead of trying mm -hmm. to have law enforcement be everything that we have agencies and advocacy groups that need to be um, you know, brought to the scene um, in lieu of law enforcement if law enforcement is not needed. And I think that that's the point that you're trying to make is you know, how do we incorporate and identify those resources and get them as a multidisciplinary uh, team in conjunction with law enforcement. So just, just so you know, we typically do not recommend independent advocate response to domestics. Um, without law enforcement um, going there and ensuring the scene is safe. Uh, now the other thing that you that's important to understand is that Urbana um, is a relatively small community. Um, so a lot of these things that we're talking about, there are resource constraints. And there are, however, you also have U of I, you've got Champaign, you have some other entities in this area where there could be collaborations <coughs> On a, on a variety of different levels, um, <clears throat> I can tell you my community, we were not big enough to have our own advocates. Um, in fact, in our area, um, there was an advocacy group that served multiple counties. And that group, and they, they had people during the day, but they also had on-call people at all hours of the night. And so there are ways to work through some of those things. Um, and again, I want to make it clear that some of the things that um, we say, gee, that would be really slick, or even Cahoots. I'll give you an example. Cahoots by itself, City of Eugene spends a million dollars a year on Cahoots alone, okay? That's a lot. And, and quite frankly, we just did this project up in Oak Park, um, and they're about the same size as you, uh, very close. <clears throat> well, they have more officers, but um, they don't have a volume that would support that kind of a model. And so um, there we recommended a hybrid model, um, doing some different things. So there's many, many, many variables, but I appreciate, I appreciate the feedback. How are we doing on time? Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left. I wanna just kind of take a pause here and just ask um, if folks have anything, any other stuff to contribute, other things that you might wanna share, or this side of the room has been really quiet. The professor in me just wants to start pointing really bad. Um, anybody have anything else you want to share? Yes, ma'am. I just had one piece too, kind of going back to the connection to other social services. I understand that you've <coughs> asked you to focus mostly on police and fire, um, but that there's all those connections around it. Um, I would also like to see some more proactive health and safety for the community, especially for things like homelessness. Um, there's sometimes you know, oftentimes seeing a whole family even with children at the side of the road and try and do what I can on a lunch break and call and connect them to services and then, you know, officer cars drive right by and it's like, I know that they're strapped, but if we have non-officers and we have a bigger system, I would love to see a proactive system that could go and reach out to people immediately, connect them to services, directly take them to a shelter, to connections. Um, also, when they're out on other calls, if they mention, you know, it's been stressful, we're having fights because of money issues. Here's the card to rent assistance and things like that. So I think that there needs to be that important connection and proactiveness to overall well-being and other social services. And, and a lot of, you know, quite frankly, this is another industry uh, endemic kind of issue. And that is that a lot of law enforcement organizations don't even know what all those resources are. Um, and that's, 
and I, I want to stop short of being critical about that. A lot of it has to do with the silos that we create within these systems, right? And so there's this group that does this thing and this group that does this thing. And well, you guys are doing that? We didn't know you did that, and, right? Um, so certainly having a better understanding of what those resources are. And by the way, um, you know, again, you may have resources available that aren't in Urban, but they might be in Champaign, or they might be at the U of I, or whatever, they, wherever they might be. So understanding those resources and educating officers about, uh, like I can tell you in, in Eugene, they actually have a list, like really comprehensive list of all this stuff that they hand out to people routinely on calls. Uh, we had a similar thing, it was a lot smaller, but we had a little pocket card that we would, the officers would carry that had you know, victim services and advocacy groups and all these different things on it. And when we went to an incident, we could just hand one of those to the person and say, hey, there's a couple members on here you can call and talk to. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, a couple more uh, suggestions from me. Um, the, well, and this is coming from the San Francisco model of like uh, alternative, alternative responses to like uh, substance use or uh, mental health situations that because it's routed through 911, right? You don't want to call someone to call 911. Um, a, I mean, a lot of people just, again, especially marginalized folks, are, are associating 911 with police. And that, like, because it is the same dispatchers, the person who dispatches police, um, if there's no uh, just like of those street response teams um, available, which there <coughs> are at least sometimes, um, the you know, police will be uh, dispatched there instead, and the street response teams there also have like the option to you know, have the discretion to call for police backup. Um, that yeah, like people's fears around. You know, a police response happening, if they call 911, are at least sometimes realized, and it, for a lot of people, it prevents them from calling in the first place. Well, and frankly, in Eugene, um, we heard there are people who will call, uh, they'll call 911 for cahoots, and when they're told cahoots isn't available, they're gonna send an officer, they say no thanks, and they hang up. And, and so, and that kind of goes back to what you were talking about, and you know, creating that trust space, and I think the other gentleman too. If the only time the police show up, something bad happens, pretty soon, that's the expectation. So we don't even want you to show up. Don't come here, right? As completely aside and apart from the national narrative and some of these other issues, right? I mean, if the only time you show up is something bad happens, pretty soon we go, I don't know if we want to invite them to the table, you know? Uncle Bill is always messing something up for us, you know? I think that's already the case regardless that you know a lot of folks don't feel comfortable calling the police um, like regardless of sort of how often they are like interacting with people um, a lot of people don't want to interact with them uh, at all like you know and you know we can go into like history of you know reasons why but that is just the case, and like for instance, you know, with sexual assault and something like uh, around only a third are reported to the police. Um, there's no alternative to a criminal <coughs> legal response um, available to uh, well. Most most yeah. communities have uh, sexual assault nurse examiner systems right. where. Um, uh, sexual assault victims can go and report and even uh, have DNA collected um, and just retained uh, in case they change their mind. And so, you know, there are some of those systems, but, and again, I don't, I don't mean to suggest that, that those impediments don't exist, right? Um, but it kind of all goes back to, um, you have a very, there's a complex, public safety system. Uh, and certainly the police have a big chunk of that. We focus a lot on that this evening. Um, 
So, uh, you know, I guess what I'll just say kind of in wrapping things up that, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks to everybody who came. Uh, number one, I appreciate that. I appreciate the comments uh, and, and folks' presence here. I really do hope that uh, if there's additional opportunities or that you'll take, check out the social pinpoint site and maybe add some commentary there if you, if you didn't have an opportunity. I do hope that um, once the survey comes out, I not only hope you take it, but you call all your friends and family, uh, hopefully here, um, and ask them to take it as well. Um, because it really is important and it will give us a much broader picture and uh, as we talked about, the goal is to get as much community penetration as we can to get the broadest uh, data set that we can produce. And again, look at that uh, in conjunction with the rest of the information and the data that we've collected. So that's our time. Again, I, I thank everybody very much for coming and, and just really appreciate you being here. And, and uh, you know, uh, I do expect, by the way, and I get this question a lot, generally the report is made available on it, to the public, this will be a public report at some point. Uh, it may be a while, this is a, a lengthy process. Uh, I would predict that the soonest you might see something might be another five or six months uh, before we're really at that spot. Uh, but we'll, we'll certainly publish those things on Social Pinpoint, that'll be promoted, and so that's a good place to watch and just monitor going forward. So thanks again everybody for coming. Appreciate your time. Thank you.